wicked. <laughs> <laughs> Brian Nass Nassa. How are you, fam? Good, thank you, man. Thanks for uh, thanks for uh, um, having me on, brother. This is a, a definitely a blessing, and yeah, I'm stoked to get into some juicy conversation. Yeah, man, let's do the damn thing. Um, so, where are you, Trinity? Are you? Yeah, Trinity Beach today, far north Queensland in Cairns, in the home pad. So, yeah, um, it's it's been good to be back. You know, I spent most of this year like traveling the world, so it's kind of nice to just be back and have a home place. So. Um, although I'm off in two weeks again or 10 days, but yeah. Where are you off to? Oh, <laughs> off to a mystery school. So yeah. Um, and yeah, off to a mystery school, really doing some really deep um, training. They say it's like kind of like a, a, like Hogwarts, X-Men and a tantric temple. <laughs> so I guess I'm always following what I love and doing what I'm, uh, passionate about so um yeah that's the next step of my when, how did you end up there like what when did you decide to go down there what's like can you tell us more it's so mysterious mystery school <laughs> yeah and i'm probably purposely gonna keep it mysterious <laughs> 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 um it just happened through uh, a couple of good friends um have just dropped it on the way and i was in samothraki in the greek islands it's just a beautiful island um it's like got it's like extinct volcanoes and natural springs and hot springs all over it. And I was doing an ISTA training there and um, it was dropped in there. And uh, also a girlfriend of mine named Zephyria as well. I heard it through her and it just kept popping up. And then um, someone said, you'd be, you'd be like perfect for this, this sort of training. And, um, and I just I was intrigued. And it's just one of those decisions that your soul resonates so strongly with that you don't even really need the information. And yes, you, you might look at the information, but like your soul was like, you need to be at this training. You need to be doing this, you know? And um, yeah, it's, it's, it's been powerful. You know what it's like when you've got a, a container, you're about to do something huge. I remember the first time I went to China, like 11, 12 years ago, that same feeling, these self-sabotaging patterns start coming up and you know, the ego and the personality body is like, is tripping out. My soul's like fully in for it, but like you've got the duality of your mind battling with the, the, the decision. So um, yeah, so it's just sort of been um, laying into that and just knowing that when the soul lands completely, particularly out of the base chakra, the journey is smooth. And if the soul, if the journey is wobbly, it's because the soul is just too elevated and hasn't had an opportunity to, to really descend down to the body. So it's just a reminder of, there's always more deeper work to be done. Is that something that you comes naturally to you? Like if you feel those feels of like, ah, oh shit, this is like that soul calling. Is that, is that something that's always been with you or have you cultivated that? Or is that new for you? Like that kind of, cause some people I know that like they're really detached from that or they don't even realize there's a voice there or a feeling there or a sensation or, or that it might be there, but they ignore it or it's just be like mm. people like, oh, what are you, what are you talking about? Feelings and, you know, like in terms of like, what are you talking about? This gut feeling, I'm, you know, that's like woo woo or, you know, it's like, it's so yeah. hippie of you or something, you know, like, is that something that, that has always been like that for you or is it something you cultivated or? Yeah, I think I've always done what I've loved. Um, and then the deeper you drop into your body, the more you're in tune with what you really want to do. It was definitely cultivated though in um, in China, um, and that was like living with the masters, and you know, then you, you, over like the the ten, I think it was seven year period of or four year, four or five years of full time training over a ten year period. So like every single day, you know, it's like I've got my university degree and like all of these ancient sort of subjects, and um, you know, particularly like you know Qigong and internal martial arts and and uh, you know uh, Nei Gong and in you know Taoist alchemy and just the different things that I that I dived into, but that opens up a, d a deeper conversation where you drop from the personality mind or the ego into more of the soul uh, and more of activating the different centers in the body, which enables you to make more of a cohesive um decision on things rather than just oh should i do this because you know mum told me to do this or dad told me to do this or my friends are doing this or or whatever so um the training over there really dropped me in and and, and you know what just daily qigong or any type of qigong practice really opens up a conversation of shen or soul so that's been really really helpful for me um and yeah that's that's, that's basically basically it yeah well I, I like you just casually dropped a few things you're like, 
hey, I'll oh, just casually drop, you know, Nagel and casually drop Chigo and practice or internal alchemy or Taoist internal like, like just elaborate on those few things for us with people who are going, what the hell are all these things he just mentioned? Yeah, this is one of the criticisms I often get is like, you know, I just kind of just assume that everyone knows that because it's been a deep part of my life that's that's integrated into my into my being. And um, yeah, look, my path wasn't really conventional, even in the space of those arts. Like I literally done what I loved and followed from one teacher to the next teacher. And sometimes it was uh, an opportunity that arose, like going to Wudang Mountain was something that arose from, I was living with the Shaolin monks and then my, my uh, brother was unwell. So I had to travel back to Australia to take care of him. And, um, and then this pocket opened up to go to Wudang Mountain to study uh, with a scholar, um, Master Hu, and to study Taoist uh, internal alchemy. And- Master Hu? Yeah, Master Who. <laughs> yeah, and uh, I just jumped on the, on the plane and, uh, you know, those days were, all, it was like a 28 hour train ride and there was only like one ticket left and it was right at the back and I had to sit in with like, you know, with, with like, yeah, like basically like the farmers and it was a 28 hour journey and you're having to watch your bag the whole time and it was, it was wild, wild west, you know, like, um, but uh, yeah, Wudang Mountain and... You didn't have any, you didn't have any Mandarin back then? No, no Mandarin at all, man. Yeah, like nothing. Like, like, I don't know, maybe Ni Hao, you know. Oh, oh, actually, that's <laughs> like Ni Hao, Xie Xie, and um, maybe Dubachi or something like that, you know what I mean? And, and uh, yeah, it was very... And, the, and uh, that, was, that was pre-internet or like you could learn, you didn't have apps and things like, you didn't have iPhone and things like this where you could just learn, you know, do a yeah. and memorize pre and all this stuff yeah. <laughs> pre-iphone pre-facebook yeah so, yeah so maybe even pre-youtube i think youtube myspace was, myspace was was definitely happening then yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah so, wow it's kind of crazy like it wasn't that it, it is a long time ago but it wasn't that long ago but so much has changed you know like um in such a short short time so yeah what else is possible in the next 10 years so you you went down there so rewind a little bit how did you end up deciding to go down there like because when you didn't you have like a club or something and where was it in greece or i can't remember where it was in israel some one of these places turkey maybe one of one of these places you had uh, oh okay yeah yeah well i used to run nightclubs and bars and that was what i did before i you know and i i created a lot of success ran multiple seven figure businesses in that space i was very good at consulting and going into a place and adding energy and getting the customer service right and and uh was that just uh, was that just because it was the family biz like that's what you'd always known or yeah i grew up in the family uh hotel and my dad was like uh they had the hotel for 50 years the other cousins have had it for like 85 or 90 years so there was like a deep transmission of like how to run a hotel and you know i guess over 50 years you you work out what works what doesn't work and you know so i just grew up in that hotel as, as, a, as a child so and just observing my dad, he used to have like everyone, like the he used to have the, the, the charisma and everyone like partying and drinking, having a good time. And, you know, my granddad used to say, there's no, there's no money in empty glasses, you know, like keep, keep the glasses flowing. And, you know, just all these old school sort of uh, wisdom. Now I guess, you know, you know, I left school in grade 11. I wasn't sure what I, what I wanted to do. And um, that there was this cocktail bartending course that came out when I was like, 15 and a half and like literally I memorized every move of the Tom Cruise cocktail thing and had all of us. So I was like, I became a flair bartender and the age of 18, I went to Tokyo and um, I got my first contract and um, to be a flair bartender. And yeah, and then- What, what compelled was, you to go to Tokyo? What, you, how did you say that in the paper? Did you know something? How did that, how yeah, did that um, eventuate? You know, to, to be honest, my, to be completely honest, my, my mum was, um, in my email account and she was applying for, for jobs uh, because she knew I was passionate about flair bartending. And she's like, Ryan, there's this job opportunity in, in, in Japan. And um, you know, I told them about your experience. And she, she was like literally typing as if she was me. I was like, mom, you're in my email. Cause back then no one used email. email. I, I didn't think I, anyone did anyway. Um, and yeah, basically went over to Japan, arrived. And that was incredible. It was very life changing. Um, but it was also like a, in a way you could say it was a darker uh, period of my life. Not really a darker period, but when I look at where my life is now to then, because it was like late nights, partying, um, you know, drinking. And actually we were, we were actually 
didn't realize it, but we're actually working for the Yakuza, you know, like it was, <laughs> it was like, oh, but I was just like a flair bartender following my passion, doing what I loved. And, you know, that so was, what your, your bar was owned by the Yakuza or it was controlled by, or was directly like, how, how was that? How yeah, did you find was, that out? Yeah, there was one that, uh, I guess you just didn't know, but then after a while, um, so the first bar was run by a, a different group and, but it was looked after like, you know, by essentially the Yakuza. Um, and by the way, they're like a very well organized mafia group. And it feels so funny for me speaking about this because my life's so different. To, so, so if you are listening, <laughs> definitely tune into the rest of the, <laughs> the podcast to get the updated version of my story. And, uh, <laughs> um, and then later on, I, I went back to Australia and I got invited to come back and um, manage, uh, it was called Quest Bar and it was the first Aussie bar that was opening up and that was directly run by the Yakuza and um, actually it was a very unfortunate sort of situation because it was uh, <sighs> like the um, my boss at the time got got like shot um, in the in the in the in the heart and in the right eye which is apparently a traditional Yakuza killing and because we were working inside of the bar it was like we were we were like all of us were suspects for the murder and um, yeah, it was uh, it was it was a full on story, and then my Japanese family, which I love and adore. So did, you, did you get interrogated or anything? Or um, yeah, there was there was uh, look. I was I was at that time I was working on a on a tourist visa, so I was like, "What the hell is going on? And what am I doing?" You know what I mean? I was just following my passion. It was good money and and stuff like that. And um, yeah, and uh you know there was there was there was like people following us after work both like because that because both you can imagine like you've got the the police trying to solve this crime who actually who actually um murdered the boss then you've got the the mafia trying to work out who actually um murdered this boss as well so it was like and then you've just got me an innocent flair bartender who loves what he's doing who loves you know at that stage flair bartending was the thing you know like um that that, that was my love at that time like i said making make your drinks for the make your drinks for the cops make your drinks for your bosses oh just just you know just customer service and uh you know yeah so <laughs> um yeah and, so and that, did that they was... get to the did they get to the bottom of it or yeah, they did. It was, uh, it was actually, um, uh, it was actually, a, I'm just being mindful, you know, of what to say and what not to say. It was actually a, a, another guy who actually was friends with, with him. Um, and he was actually at the funeral. Uh, I didn't go to the funeral because I was like freaked out. This is like, you know, I was like 18 years old and just following what I love and running this bar. And then I remember being drew, brought into the office and, and um, Aaron, he was the, he was the he was the like the overall manager of the place, and I was just I was brought in as a, a bar manager because I had really good skills at that particular thing, and uh, and he's like, man, this is what's happened, and um, and I was like, whoa, and he's like, we need you to just run the bar because we're you know there, whatever else is going on, but he used to come in into the bar and um, with like a whole suitcase full full of cash, and um, and I didn't know it was full full of cash. He's like, Ryan, I want you to to watch this. I'm like, okay, cool. I just grab it and I'll just slide it underneath the office and leave it in a thing. And I'd go back to the bar because I'm about service and making sure it's all running smooth. And he's like, no, 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 no. You need to watch it. And I'm like, yeah, okay, it's just there. I'm gonna be able to sit. No, no, you need to watch it. It's full. It's full of money. I'm like, Phew. so I just like sit inside of the in the office and just sort of watch it. And and um, yeah. So you know that was that was yeah. So I ended up having to leave that job because my Japanese family were like, cool. You, you can stay there, but you have to move out or because it was on international use and, and, and stuff like that. It was, um, yeah, it was, a yeah, it was, a, um, definitely, a definitely a scary situation at, at the, at the time to be, to be sort of, um, you know, strung in between. So definitely. Yeah. So the, what's beautiful about Japanese culture is they had a, a period of 250 years, um, known as the, the Edo period. And in this period, the Japan was closed off from, you know, you weren't allowed to go out, you weren't allowed to go in. And in that time, they all had to study the Confucius classics. Um, and the first book, the small book of learnings, is really what makes Japanese culture so special today. Uh, and that's, that is that everyone's very efficient, very professional, very serving from the heart, um, um, because they had this 250 year period. And actually, this is beautiful 
beautiful lesson. Um, so the three small teachings from Confucius that you were taught as a child, uh, which literally I run my business off today and um, I run my life off as much as possible today is um, these three principles. So the first one is self-responsibility, self-management, self-hygiene. It's the first thing that we're impressed upon or taught on is how to look after self. So being on time, hygiene, self-responsibility, uh, it's always coming back to self. Um, and then the second one is correspondence. And what this means is how we deal with others, um, particularly from the heart center. So like when, that's why they say, Shumasen and Dozo, and they, they welcome you in, they're very, very sort of polite. It's actually, the essence of it is to, to, to welcome you from the heart. Because once you're welcoming someone through the heart, you, you kick in this state of Wu Wei. So I, I would imagine now most of Japanese culture, this is on autopilot and they probably disconnected from the, the actual spiritual principles. Because if you're serving someone through the heart, you get into this state of Wu Wei where everything self-organizes in your field. Um, and, and so that's the whole idea of like, right, if you can serve from the heart, success will naturally unfold in its, in its way, you know? You do, the, so the, you do these small things like smile at a person, make them feel welcome. Like I remember in Japan, um, I'm not sure how old I was, but like 24, I was going to see my, my uh, Japanese mom. And I wanted to, I got off the train station, went into a chemist and I asked for where's the closest internet cafe. Um, and basically like this lady came out of the chemist and walked me like three blocks down just to show me where it was. Like she could have drawn a map, but it was like this whole devotion of service. Like, okay, cool. You've got to find, and it's beautiful in Japan. You know, if you lose something on a train, you'll, you'll find it again. And the culture is like magnificent like that. Um, this, Again, with the second principle, there's two parts to it. It's excellence through the heart with what your work is. So whatever your work is, um, leading from the heart, but having excellence from the heart center. Um, so that's why whether it's sushi or whether it's cars, or there's like this excellence with what they do. So it's like the lesson for, for anyone listening is just like, first of all, self-responsibility, self-management, self-hygiene. The second thing is correspondence. So like everyone you deal with in your business or your work come from the heart, this level of, you know, not from the mind, completely from the heart and have excellence in your craft through the heart. And when you do this, you channel the heavenly energy known as uh, De, that's in Tao De Ching. And De is like a charismatic power that we kick off when we're in flow that gets us into the state of Wu Wei. Um, things like Qigong and Neigong and these internal practices help cultivate this energy. But the essence of serving others through the heart and having excellence in your work through the heart helps to channel this from the heaven, heavenly energy. And we create this, uh, this state of De, which is like a charismatic uh, you know, power that allows, us, allows that Wu Wei energy to self-organize in our field. Um, so that 250 year close off period in Japan, you know, all the kids, that was the, these first two lessons were taught to like, you know, when you're, when you're a child, you know, so it's like, so what, what, do you, what do you mean by closed off? Was it like, there's no one was in or out or like, what, what do you mean by closed off? Hmm. So yeah, in essence, it was like, um, I don't know the particular the details, but it was a 250 year period where Japan decided that, right, we're, we're, we're closing the borders, no one's allowed out, no one's allowed in. I'm sure, I'm sure stuff would have happened and stuff like that, but, uh, and they just had a closed off period where they just, you know, they really developed the, the inner culture, you know? So, um, and I think it was the nine books of Confucius that they would study, but the first book, the small book of learnings is just these three teachings. And, and the third one is um, knowing when to stop, which is something in the Western culture that we, we often don't even think about, you know, but it's like when to stop the argument, when to stop um, that business or when to stop that habit. And it's just this discipline of just when to stop, when to stop digging enough, when to stop digging up fossil fuels. <laughs> yeah. 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 Knowing the self and knowing when to stop. And it's a discipline. And, and these three practices are something that I would meditate on daily. Cause when I first got this lesson from one of my Japanese mentors, um, he's a very close friend of mine, Jiro. Um, I like literally was like, wow. And I just entered every day. I would med meditate upon these principles. Um, and you know, I was very, already well trained on the concepts of Wu Wei. Um, and then like I started, then I was like, wow, you know, you start to cross pollinate different teachings, different maps and stuff start to overlay each other. And it just gave me a deeper understanding of, of basically how to get into flow because well, Wu Wei trumps the flow state. So it's like, for me, I would rather, you know, if you've got a choice, I'd rather be in Wu Wei um, and affecting heaven's will in, in a natural way than actually, than actually being in flow. So, that was, that was the concept for me is like, how can you re lead this inspiring 
spiritual life where you can still, because Confucius was trying to teach the kings the, you know, these teachings essentially to get into the state of Wu Wei. So the Confucius has a way of getting into Wu Wei and sort of the Taoist. Uh, and actually, once you understand these core principles, you realize that almost every core religion or philosophy or spiritual practice has an entry point into the state of Wu Wei that can be developed into different capacities. So. Mm -hmm. And is that, that's, I know we were talking the other day about some of this stuff and like practically, how does that look? I know, like you said, you were meditating on these concepts for every day for, I don't know how long you were doing it, but is that, is that a practical way you can then bring these concepts into the body and into like the knowingness of actually, you know, there's principle, there's theory, but then there's actual action and, you know, really yeah. embodied concepts into real life, right? So how does one get the concept and then actually bring it to life? Yeah, I think when it comes to embodying um, spiritual wisdom and 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 the and not not the spiritual wisdom from like a from the outside, the actual spiritual wisdom of our soul essence or our soul calling. Um, for me, the most powerful way has actually been through through qigong and neigong and even some of the kung fu exercises that I that 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 I sort of teach. And the reason for that is because there's a slow opening of the body and there's no force. So what happens is the body starts, the fascia and all, all of it starts to open up and then it basically allows the wisdom to drop into the body. If the body is stiff and the meridian channels aren't open, um, you basically, all the meridian channels connect into all the chakras, uh, you know, all the glands. So it's like, for me, the meridian channels are these information highways that amplify our potential one, your energetic vibration goes up. So, you know, if you're, if you're a law of attraction, it's like higher vibration, you know, more awesome things are taking place in your life. So whenever you practice Qigong and energetic development and you open up the meridian channels, you literally are in a higher vibration, but there's an information highways that are opened through the body. And actually it's just the last couple of years that science has proven that the meridian channels exist. So it's good for the rational minds, but if you're deep in practice, you just, you experience it and you don't need to, uh, you know, you don't even need to use the, you just know it. So, um, and you can feel it. So for me, it's like um, embodying wisdom. First of all, I, I honestly believe, you know, obviously there's repetition, but, um, and that helps you embody wisdom. But I think like the fast path is, is, is opening up the, the, the body's, the energetic centers, the meridian pathways through Qigong, Neigong, or some of the internal martial arts and stuff like that. Um, and approaching it from more of the feminine essence too, because some of the, the, the Indian yogic traditions were traditional, created by men, um, where some of the, the Taoist ones were created by uh, females, because I've also studied a lot of Taoist yoga as well, which is a, the feminine expression of yoga. Um, so some of the softer ways I find are better to, to in, in, in body wisdom, but not to say that, that they both are really, really good. But if you look at yin is the birth of yang, so yin is the, is the root, and then before yin is emptiness and, and nothingness, so everything comes from nothingness. So um, for me, it's like, if you can study classics, like 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 literally reading the Tao Te Ching and stuff like that might inspire the soul or the mind a little bit, but all the ancient masters know that it's through the cultivation of your practice that gets you connected to the Tao. Not the, the theory is just the, the signpost that's giving you a, a sense of where to go. It's the practice and the cultivation that opens up the, the space for embodiment of wisdom. And then, because wisdom, if you're just knowing it intellectually and not experiencing in the body, is not really wisdom. Wisdom is the, is the, is the being, you know, being able to, uh, and then like wisdom changes. So you'll get one concept of, of what it, one character or one concept, and it's changing as your own inner wisdom is developing to whatever stage of consciousness that you're at. So you'll like, same within martial arts, the same within spiritual wisdom, the concept changes as we move through different stages of consciousness. So that's wisdom is being able to understand what it means to us. Uh, and it could be different to someone else at a different stage. And as long as we know ourselves, again, Confucius principle, know yourself, you know, and, and actually all saints or sages or, or scholars, you know, if you really boil it down, it's always going back to knowing yourself, you know, then you'll know the universe, know yourself, you know, another, and these are sayings from Lao Tzu or Buddha. Um, yeah, so it's, it's really coming back to, to that. So the embodiment is, is opening up the meridian channels in a slow way to change the physical body because the physical body and the mind will follow each other. So you transform the mind, you'll transform the body. But if you transform the body, the mind has a far greater transformation because actually the whole body is mind. 
it is one collective intelligence. So if that body goes through an opening of, of its wisdom and its, 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 its energy centers are open, then the, the wisdom and the embodiment of the, of the knowledge is, is uh, it's, it's digested a lot more. So hopefully that um, It does. And what do you feel? Because <clears throat> uh, I know you talk about the, the Zen uh, the Zen Archer, is it? Um, the program that, you, that you've run, I know that's been through many iterations. You know, I've been work, working with you for, for many years now. We've known each other at least 10 years. And some of the stuff we did is, you know, informing one another and you're informing me on stuff. And, you know, like that Zen Archer program is like the newest, like it's like the cutting edge of all of those iterations of everything that you've been building over the years. Can, can you tell us a little bit about that and also just what principles that runs on and, um, yeah, like what can people, you know, are drawn to that, that, that type of stuff? Yeah, sure. So I find um, the, the best way to describe it is like, well, if you take ISTA, for example, it's a fast path of integrating spirituality and sexuality. Um, the, the, and, uh, the international, what is it called? The, the International School, School of, of uh, Temple Arts, yeah. Um, the Zen Archer is a is a fast. Shout out to Baba Des. We've had we've had Baba Des on a, on the podcast. So shout out to oh, Baba Des. Is that? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and the Zen Archer is a fast path of integrating spirituality and high performance. Because my challenge was that you know before I went to the mountains of China and lived with the monks and the masters and the Taoists and stuff like that, I was running businesses and I was in the you know in the hustle in the flow, really out of harmony with myself, and um, and then I went into the mountains and I went into this deep path. And then out of that, I was starting to mentor high performing entrepreneurs, you know, they're looking for this spiritual wisdom to, and, you know, essentially enhance their creativity or their potential or help them with more uh, concepts of being aligned. And, um, and then what I was realizing that as I had my spiritual friends who are just, you know, incredibly and creative and, and connected to their body and um, but they'd have trouble executing or they'd be triggered around money or, or or things like that and then when I was chatting to my high performing entrepreneur friends that were kind of disconnected from the body and there was only we could chat about impact and giving back to the world and stuff like that which is beautiful but but it but it was like they were disconnected from their spiritual essence and so those conversations were cut off then after a while I just got tired of like ha you know ha having to be half of myself for both people so I was like you know what rather than just complain about it, why not be the change that you're actually looking for? So I was like, look, I'm just going to integrate all of my knowledge and create a program so people can go through an online mystery school for eight weeks and actually integrate high performance and spirituality and create their life and go through the, the, the core essence of, you know, stuff from relationships to money to spirituality and how someone can actually integrate that into their own life and land that in their body. So it's a six month program. Um, you learn lots about energetic development and um, yeah, it's, a, it's an amazing supportive container where you can literally amplify your potential and, uh, and learn a lot about, you know, basically yourself. It's a self-actualization sort of program. So we've got a beautiful team. What I'm most proud about about that is everyone's, everyone on the team is a soul-based team. It's not like you've got someone who's tapped in and then their team's disconnected. Like from a soul level I'm talking about, everyone is, is like a soul and they're ready to serve and they've embodied the principles and done the work. So yeah, very, very proud of that, um, of that program. Is that, can you share a little bit about like the principles or like what's covered? Is it like the six months? Is it one month is focused on this? One month is focused on that. Are there some core themes that, that you, you mentioned some of the themes there, like self-actualization, uh, like, is there specific things that you have as, as overarching principles that you, that you tend to share, not just in this, but in all your work? Yeah, sure. Look, there's, there's 13, there's 13 principles that um, everyone's encouraged to embody over the, over the, the eight week journey. So it's a six month course, but the eight weeks is a container of, of living the golden mean. How can you be a high performer and divinely connected within? So through the program, you actually hit a lot of your upper limits as well as you face some of the shit that naturally arises, but particularly you'll, you'll meet your upper limits. And the question is, how can we still perform high, get everything done, while still balancing this spirituality. Because what you'll see is most people will split. They'll just like, they'll get to that point. They, and so the golden meme is the balance point between two extremes. So what we're looking to, yeah, to, 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 to embody, not balance because balance has this concept of there's only so much on this side and only so much on that side. So it's like, we want to live the golden meme and explore the question of what's possible, how high we can perform and how, 
high we can be connected within to our values and connected to our body over that eight weeks. And honestly, honestly explore that question for eight weeks. So at the end of it, you're completely radically transformed and you have a new relationship of how that works for you. So often once people pass through that eight weeks and they've done the, the set in the mornings and archer practice and the evenings and archer practice, and they've got week seven, which goes into other deep practices, once they pass through this, and this stuff that I've learned from Richard Branson to the Shaolin monks to Taoist monks, it's a very, once they've gone through this container, then they become their own self-actualized person of some of their own rituals and practices start to embody because it's principles um, last forever, techniques come and go. So it's the 13 principles help guide them into their mastery. And because for, for me, it's like, um, I believe in authentic expression and a person celebrating their unique genius and their unique calling. What is that soul? How can I get someone to land in their soul and design a life and a business or a calling around that? Um, and, you know, I celebrate people's individuality and I, and I want to embrace that. And essentially that is the Tao. As soon as you try to make that dogmatic and say, you need to be like this, you need to be like that. It becomes a very heavy religious concept, which is uh, in essence, I'm very influenced by Taoism. As soon as you start to label things, it's no longer the truth. So it's like you go through a container for eight weeks to cultivate the essence of the foundation. Then, then there's a conversation that arises outside of that eight week container. Some of the, like, I'm happy to send the audience the 13 principles too. Um, there's also uh, one of the, you know, why the Zen Asha is because the program is about manifestation. And the one thing that I was, I was on the beach of, in Lebanon, listening to this 15 minute um, hypnosis, you know, back in the days that we used to know each other, Zulu, and we were like, you know, <laughs> hypnosis and journaling every day. And we'll just ride into the, to the self, you know, as much as we could self-actualization, self master as we could, we were just deep into that. And, um, and uh, yeah, and I was just listening to this uh, 15 minute hypnosis. And it was like about this concept of the Zen Archer, how he lines up his target or she lines up her target they become one mind, body, you know, spirit, essence, the yi and their chi is aligning that target. They become one with the target. And when you're one with the target, when you let go of the arrow, it's already hit the target. There's no separation. So what you find with people when they're going for what they want, they're already separating themselves from it. So it's, it's this battle of, the, of their mind is already putting it outside themselves. So the concept of the Zen Archer is with everyone goes in with an eight week target. So something like I spoke, uh, introduced myself completely in, in Chinese on the first one very deeply. Um, and everyone goes in with a different target, some uh, artistic expression or some business goal or something they want to do. And it's usually a six month goal that we've, we've actually worked out the philosophy of how to like achieve that in eight weeks, because you remember you're amplifying your energy, you're journaling, you're doing all of these core practices from spirituality and high performance integrated. So people are hitting their targets much faster. So everyone goes in with a target and the concept is, is through the morning practice, they actually draw the arrow and line it up with their target, pull it back. They drop into like a deep Nei Gong stance. They, put, they, they have this arrow that they imagine they line up with their target and they let it go. So there's this embodiment Rather than being a mental concept, their body's going, hey, I get what it feels like to be one with this desire. So then if you're walking around that and that's in your body and your soul, it's, it's, you just feel like you've already achieved it. Because the one thing I learned from all the Kung Fu Masters Zulu was they all have this deep belief in what they do. Like as I, when, we, when we started up studymartialarts.org, which is a business that helps people from all over the world find the right Kung Fu Masters and Academies, um, my first business in line with my passions, uh, like I had to go around and meet all these masters. So it was this unique experience of meeting all of these incredible teachers. And they all have this belief, like this is the best in China. This is the best. Stuff. <laughs> after a while I was like, wow, this, and it's true. Like you have to believe in yourself and you have to believe in what you do. And, and part of that belief is what enables you to be empowered. So, you know, as long as the, there's always a shadow side to everything, as long as a belief doesn't lead you blindly off your path, there's always going to be that question of, you know, is this right? Is this serving? Is this true? But that belief should always be there. And so the embodiment part of, of the essence is the, is the alignment to their target. Um, and there's really a couple of components to the Zen Archer. One is you'll go in with an eight week target that everyone's, you know, which one of the team and myself will do a, like a really uh, awesome strategy session. Um, and we'll get that clear. The other part is the, uh, the spiritual side. So everyone works through the book, the prophet, um, and they, they set up, a, they have a spiritual accountability buddies and they'll go through this book. 
that is incredible um, the way that, that that container is set up. So it teaches you how to set up a spiritual container and, and go deep into that. Uh, and the other part is um, the eight week modules, which go through the first week is, is you know, basically laying down the foundations of the 10 daily habits, the 13 principles, uh, getting your Zen Archer target really clear, how to articulate that and communicate who you are and what your target is. Because if you can't actually say your target in a way that, that it resonates to another person, then actually you don't even really know it yourself. So that's that's on week one. The week two is you design your perfect day, which has been a, a something that's impacted my life massively. And it, and it it wasn't until like literally four years ago that that dropped in much more deeper from other mentors. You know, so that's a really well cultivated piece that I brought in. Then um, week three is we it's all about money. Uh, week four is like it goes into autumn and it's like uh, it's, it's, a, it's a lot around uh, self-actualization and really being aware of where are you at with the 13 principles in your journey. Week five is health and self-care. Week six goes deep into energetic cultivation because a lot of stuff there that I've received orally from different masters and people who are from Chinese medical doctors, stuff like that, they're in there going, wow, this stuff's incredible. It's a really, um, you know, deep training on the energetics. Um, Week seven is like Wu Wei spirituality um, and goes deep into like how you can live in your, your king or queen energy and have this spiritual sort of power as well. Because that's what Confucius's message was from the channel from the golden age period. And that's what he was trying to bring through um, to the different empires at that sort of stage. But he wasn't successful in spreading it completely around. Um, and then we can. That's, that's, what, that's, that's what we're here for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're the, we're the modern day philosophers, you know, so, you know, and, and, and everyone is. And I think like it's important to look forward because, you, you know, your memory, sorry, your vision has to be stronger than your memory. Otherwise, you're always living from the past version of yourself, not the future version of yourself, right? Even though we've got to be in the now. But most people's memory of, of their past is so much stronger. But also when it comes to like saints and sages or scholars or whatever, they had a small roll of the dice take what worked from them, embody those principles and look forward in terms of what we can generate and create. Don't look back and go, wow, they were incredible. You know, cause if you get lost in the past, you get lost in the past, right? But if you can take the essence of the past and take the, the beauty of it and use it to cultivate a garden that creates a new future, then we can bring through a new threshold of, of consciousness in the planet, um, you know, which is good, which is good for everyone. 100%. And what do you find are the common like side effects of, of doing programs like this? I know that you've run them for years and you know that you see people go through transformations, but what, what type, what's the typical, I know they're probably not typical because everyone's individual, but you know what I'm saying? Like, do you see people shift from one state to another or like go from this to that? Is that, is there a common theme along uh, from everyone who, who does these programs with you? Yeah, yeah, there's, there's, there's so many over the six months, but the, one of the core ones is just that inner potential is, uh, is awakened. Um, and that, you, that manifests with uh, alignment of purpose. So it's like, um, you know, heaven's will or a greater level of manifestation or a greater level of channeling what you're here to do starts to come through. And just an ease, you know, I think especially in, in like Australian culture, there's this battle mentality and everyone needs to struggle to get a result. And, and uh, you know, I just live with these high performing masters who are just relaxed and in flow. And it's like, you can actually create an incredible outcome without having to push. And, um, and I think that's one of the things that people drop into. It's like, oh, wow, it can actually be easy. Um, and they get to experience that and it leaves an impression in their heart that, that, that changes their whole family as well. You know, when once, once one person truly drops into their heart and they feel it, then it, it, it literally resonates a different vibration in, in their whole family or friends environment, which can self-organize all these beautiful things into your life and self-organize out and create a lot of challenge as well, because it's like your soul, once you drop into the soul, it's almost got a demand for the, the, for the life that it wants. Um, but you know, most people are being a personality or their ego is their forefront. Um, it doesn't mean that they're a bad person, but that's just what it is. So the fears, the doubts, the worries, uh, and the souls on the back, um, really the soul wants to come forward. And, and once it's spoken to, or once it's awakened, then we can get clear on what our soul values are and what our fuck yes life is and how we want to design and create that. Because if it's coming from the ego or the personality, 
it's always going to be, it's like you create like suffering or a disconnect from what you really want. And the journey of evolution is, is not radical. It's slow and your the lessons are slow. And I don't know, you know, after a while you just get frustrated with that path. So, um, are, are, are there some, are there some like, I don't know for yourself, like have you had moments where or days or weeks or months where you're like, oh, I just can't feel the, the motivation. I'm not feeling inspired. I'm just feeling like I don't want to get out of bed. I'm feeling like, like you just find yourself procrastinating a lot or not wanting to deal with whatever you know you should deal with. Do, do you ever experience that yourself? Uh, and what do you do when, you, when those times come if you do? Yeah, yeah, very good. I think the most important thing that, that the whole globe needs to, to align with and connect with as being a collective philosophy that we all share around the, all around the planet is uh, recreating a positive relationship to those feelings. So it's okay to, to sleep in. It's okay to feel bad. It's okay to have those moments. And, and also, you know, one thing that Cahil Gibram says, a beautiful, the, the, from the prophet, um, beautiful, uh, lots of the writers today are inspired by his work. He says that the, the pain is the encompassing of the understanding of who we actually are. So we've got this mentality to focus on the outcome, to, to eat the cup of cement and to harden up and to push forward and keep suppressing the pain. And what he's saying is the pain is the encompassing of the understanding of who we are. So if we're judging these bad feelings, like we're sleeping in or feeling tired or that, and we're trying to like, you know, big love to Tony Robbins, but like get into the state and, and you know, disconnect from that how you're feeling and get yourself into a pumped up state just to and, and you know eventually that shit is going to come up and it's going to and it's going to come up in a, a, a disease or a sickness or a form of depression so like i think the first step is to associate that it's okay to feel those ways and and not to suppress it allow it to come through you and actually listen what is this trying to tell me don't don't go oh my god i'm feeling bad i'm feeling depressed i, I slept in today I'm, a, I'm not a good person or whatever the conversation is the dialogue needs to be nice i'm feeling these feelings what are they trying to show me and then learn to go through some shadow work like big component of the work that i do and also the work that you do as well zulu is that shadow is that shadow work because like there needs to be a, a different conflict. The first step is different uh, neuro alignment to the way we feel. And it's like a celebration when that comes up now, because the gold is found in the dirt. Where do we find gold? It's in the dirt, right? And that's, that's where, so it's in the shadow where we need to be able to, to dive into that. And then it's learning how to process those emotions out of the body and not to try to run away from them, but to actually own those shadow sides and process it out. So those darker emotions aren't kept in the body because yes, you can, this is what trips me out about the, the, the ascended masters or the light workers of that. And, and for very much of my life, I was like that. And I still am. I love rainbows, unicorns, magical things. <laughs> <laughs> my life is very much like that in many ways, you know, like I, I love my life, but um, the gold is found in the shadow and, and in the light as well. But it's like, if we, the thing is when you ascend up over those feelings and you try to get away from them or you try to do the work to get, it's like the vibration is still there underneath the core and the shame sits so far that if you ascend yourself up and do lots of meditation, lots of practices and even Qigong or whatever yoga or whatever it is that you're doing, you're just elevating yourself away from that. Emotion. And shame sits so deep on the core that you won't even really notice it's there, but that vibrational frequency is still there. So the best way to describe it is you're a boat, you're in the ocean, you've got your sails, you've, and you've worked hard, you've, you've got a new GPS system, you've got a team, you've been doing all this work, you've been getting to your outcome, but you're still not quite there. And what it is, is you haven't actually went down deep inside and, and, and acknowledged that there are some of these anchors deep down in the taking ocean. Me. Holding the you're taking the anchor back. Back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we've got to go down and let those go. And then, so sometimes getting what we want is not so much trying harder. It's actually acknowledging what we need to let go of. Um, and, and, and the reason why we don't want to let go of is because the ego has got an emotional attachment to the reality that we've got now. And it's the fear of letting that go. Um, and after a while, we need to realize that when we have, when we, when we die, our, our, our dark darkness shines bright and it's like it's reassociating that to a positive relationship with cool. It's okay to actually allow my ego to die and then I get to shine, but it is scary sometimes to do that. And that's why we need to find deeper teachers to guide us on that, that path. So, 
Well, would you would you recommend people like what's a practice that people can do uh, to actually get comfortable with that dying or that ego death? Or I know is that you know some some people take psychedelics, some people um, go in float tanks and do like sensory deprivation. You know, there's all types of different practices. Even even there's some meditation practices. I don't know if there's anything in in the Taoist alchemy where like you're actually practicing this death. You know. Mm, yeah, very good question. You know, ego, ego deaths can happen in so many different ways, you know, on mini and micro levels. And um, I guess a person has to be clear on how much they want to transform if they want a radical transformation. There's certain paths that I would recommend. And if they're just getting into it, um, then maybe they take it a little bit slower. But then sometimes I've met people at the beginning and they're like, I want all in. I want it all. You know, I'm like, you sure? Yeah cool. All right, great. You know, and then other times you've had more experienced people and when they come up to radical transformations, their ego holds on more than anyone, particularly like the spiritual ego, because it's like they, sometimes the spiritual ego can actually hold on. I've, at least the, my experience and what I've found in, in my circles is that people with the spiritual ego can actually have way more of a bigger ego than, than people in business, because in business, it's like you have to show up and you have to fail every day and move forward. And there's an element of your, you know, the downside to the business person is they're usually disconnected to how they feel and they don't honor their feelings because they're just used to pushing through. Um, and, uh, and cool. So I'm just going to close the, the, the door and Zulu because, um, someone's doing some work. Yeah. Cool. Um, these are, these are, this is what I would, uh, recommend. You can get in contact with Zula and I to go through the spiral. That's a that's a fast path of of you know, of basically uh, going from the lowest levels of consciousness and working on an ascending journey up to the top, but working through the shadow aspects of all of that, all the fundamental, you know, triggers that are that are in the body. Um, and that's a, that's a really good path. You know, if you wanted to go deep and you want to really have a marriage between the feminine and masculine, I think like like Ister is a great is a great place to, uh, to, to do that. Um, obviously, you know, my, I find my, the Zen Archer program is a really good introduction into, into shadow work as well. Um, and basically, you know, it's just understanding where your edge is and just moving into that. You've got your comfort zone then outside of that, you've got the magic, I call it the fuck yes zone, like where the magic happens. But then outside of that, you've got, you'll put yourself into trauma as well. So it's like understanding that if you stay in a comfort zone too long, it becomes a black hole and your life will suck after a while. But it, but if you're, but you know, if you can honestly each day, and if you're unsure of what that is, just to go slow and find your boundaries, but, but move outside of that edge, because you don't know what you don't want until you step out and realize, Oh, that's not what I want. And then you actually establish what a boundary is for you and boundaries can change. You know, it's not like things are fixed forever, but, um, and, uh, and I, I'm loving the, the Egyptian like mystery school sort of techniques now, which is like where you, where you go into the emotion and you feel it. So if there's someone on the call right now, you know, what you could do is you could feel into those darker sort of emotions and see where they sit in the body and understand that sound and movement can, can press them through the body. So what I usually do, is I'll just take a deep breath and I'll feel into that, that, that emotion or really sit with it, you know, not ascend above it, sit with it and honor it for what it is. And what, what is it trying to show, so give, show me? Give us an example in your, in your own life, because like, you know, I don't know if it's like jealousy or something like, cause you know, it went from the big shifts from like super monogamous to like being in an open relationship, you know, like the, those big <laughs> shifts, I'm sure there, have, there was some, some uh, shadow work that had to be done around that. You know, like, can you give us some examples of yeah, specific things you actually did to, to sit with and, and that you helped transform by like, going into them as opposed to ascending, like, above them? <sighs> yeah. Um, the monogamous piece to the open piece is, at the moment, the best way. How that happened, it happened organically through someone that two hearts aligned and the alignment across all levels of of, of consciousness in a way just integrated and it just was a was an absolute you know fuck yes for us both and um and coming to that piece you know i don't even know where i land with that you know i don't it's like i don't want to put myself in a new in another box you know is this the box that i'm in you know mm -hmm. i may still be monogamous later on or it may change the the thing is just being true true to yourself and knowing what's important and, and exploring the edge 
you know so that's a whole conversation itself but going back to your to the point like how that happened and arose it, it kind of just happened naturally and organically and obviously i let go of lots of stuff and i think open relating if you're in a space where you're single i think i would it's it's i would actually give it a try and um because you know you must be equipped with some tools otherwise it's going to be it's probably going to be a hard journey to, to process the, the triggers. You need to understand that everything's a reflection of your own consciousness and you need a way like self clearing to, to, to at least process the emotions. But what I would do Zulu at any moment when I'm feeling these emotions that I want to clear out of my body, if I've got nothing else that anyone can do on this call, I'll feel into the emotions, whether it's, whether it's fear or worry or sadness or grief or doubt or shame. And I'll feel where it sits in my body and I'll, and I'll, and I'll try to get an understanding of it and of what that actually means to me and what's going on. What is the trigger here and how's it coming up? Then I want to process it out of the body. Um, and so what I do is I just simply take a deep breath into it and I roar into my hands and I create like a vibration. So I'll, I'll do it sort of now. So. <laughs> <sighs> and what I'm doing is after I've processed it, I want him to breathe out of the body and I'll do that two or three times. I'll go again. <sighs> so what I'm doing is, is I'm vibrating that core emotion. And the key is I'm not just yelling mindlessly for attention or, you know, screaming or anything like that. I'm going into the, I'm going into the emotion to vibrate the essence of where it's held in my being, which organ is it held into? Which part of my body is it held into? I want to vibrate it with a sense of like understanding, like, Hey, I see you. And it's, and I want to thank you for whatever gift you've given me, because if it's made me shy, I would have developed beautiful qualities of maybe self inquiry or something like that. But I'm, but I'm also want to acknowledge that now that I let go of it, what's possible on the other side. So that's something that someone could do straight away. And you just, you just breathe in, you press the, you know, you create like a, like a um, container where there's a, a level of like, because uh, when someone hugs you, you feel love, right? So you want this feeling of like uh, pressure to build up in the body where you can process that emotion out. And, um, and then what you want to do is and inhale, exhale, and let the frequency out. So you're not holding on to the emotions. A lot of people, when they, they do emotional work, they're actually, actually just amplifying the emotions or it sticks more deeply in their body as well. So, um, mm -hmm yeah that's that's how i would how i would do it and look there's so many ways you know even vipassana even you know that was that was you know, a lot of stuff came up for me when i was doing a vipassana i don't, had a hundred days training with master lu where i wasn't allowed out of this confined space for 66 days or something like that and that was like full on because it was hardcore training every single day but you're training in a soft relaxed way so it was kind of military mm -hmm. but yet deep hard training every day in this soft flowing way so and no days off so after like two weeks of full-on training six to eight hours every single day you've got these like real thoughts of, and this pressure of like no sitting and relaxing it was all the pressure was always on you you know and you've got these real concerns that come up like even experts say you need to have proper rest you know and i'm like like you know 21 days into no days off i'm like man i feel like i need a rest so all of your shit does arise and and um you know, there's, there's so many different ways, you know, so there's, and hopefully I've shared some paths to, to reaction. 100%. <clears throat> Thanks for sharing. And the, in terms of like just touching on some of that shadow work and you were mentioning like, um, little bits on like this, we just had recently, are you okay day? I think it was yesterday, maybe the day before. And, um, you know, these idea of being, you, you did mention before we get in this idea of, you know, just drink a bit of, concrete and harden the fuck up and these kind of mentalities of it's it's yeah. not okay to be vulnerable it's not okay to be weak you know or like being vulnerable is weak or if you are feeling weak and not strong but that's that's a negative you know like so is it something that you've encountered in your upbringing in your surroundings just being you know the kid in in cans or wherever it is you know like i know in australia that's a very kind of uh, prevalent kind of concept you know like oh, if you're crying and you're a guy then you're weak or you're soft or you're a girl or whatever it is you know so what's been your journey with that and how have you yeah what have you experienced in your in your journey around vulnerability being okay being uh, i don't know if you experienced depression and these types of things yeah i've been really working on the vulnerability piece a lot the last uh two three years because 
I'm telling you now, your body has more wisdom than any book or any course or anything that you'll ever do in the world. And if you can wake up to your feelings and really feel them and have a positive relationship to them, they're neither negative or bad. It just is what it is. That's where your life will start to grow because everything that you're suppressing is, is causing depression in a way, you know, because it's depressed emotions. So that you, you need to express and feel and, and let them out. So, um, and it's important for men especially and even for women to encourage men to to say hey it's it's and to hold space for them and and allow them to 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 cry or to be vulnerable and see that as a beautiful thing and actually and actually nurture that in a way and um and you know it, it, otherwise you're going to cause sickness in the inside of the body and particularly in the, in the west in australia and in, in america and other countries it's like western medicine and I love doctors, by the way, you know, like I, I, I love natural medicine and I love doctors. My beef is there's not much integration in between the two. You know, that's my beef. You know, that's that's the drives me crazy. So um, because and I can get it because they're both throwing rocks at each other. So you create separation, right? Like you're not going to go over and go, hey, you know, you're if they're b both worlds are like, you know, so you've got tripped out people on the natural side, like saying crazy shit. To, and then, and, and you know, they're like, well, you guys are just loopy. And then, you know, like vi vice versa. And um, and there needs to be more integration. So, but in the Western medical thing, it's, it's like the emotional body is not even really included as a thing. So it's like, okay, you're, you're depressed here, have some antidepressants and stuff like that. And, and a lot of these things, there's a faster path, to, there's a healthier path to being able to feel our emotions. Um, and that needs to be integrated into the, these are, this is my opinion too. Like I'm obviously not a doctor or anything like that. Um, but it's the, the awakening and the understanding of the, of the emotional body. It's like, it's like, how can the emotional body not be a thing? What you've never felt love, you know, you've, you know what I mean? Or you've never felt anger or you've never felt dep depression. Like, so it's like these aspects need to be integrated into, into just every day. You know, at the moment we've got, um, my, my Qigong, it's, it's a rising in daycare centers and you should see the results Zulu kids fighting to now all like harmoniously sharing and caring, saying positive affirmations. And, and uh, the parents are being inspired by what the kids are saying. Like they're, they're dropping in and saying these beautiful things and it's, and it's helping the kids are transforming the family home by the, cause their essence, cause once you're in line with heaven's will, or, you know, you're just in line with yourself, you, you literally permeate this positive environment in your space that inspires all of those around you. Um, it's just like, if you go to a feng shui master, if you're practicing qigong a lot of the feng shui rules change because your energy is much stronger than the environmental flow around you but not to say that the danger with qigong and these ascended practices um qigong is the relationship between heaven and earth so it definitely has a shadow side as you know zulu like you could be practicing it some days and it brings up a whole bunch of crap and other days you're like whoa i'm empowered and it's time to go and things are manifesting and your phone's blowing up with opportunities and and you you know you've got these downloads and uploads happening um but it's if we ascend if we ascend uh yeah if we ascend above the emotional body um this is bringing up so many beautiful conversations but but if we ascend above the emotional body going back to the heart and up sort of conversation and that it's like it's like men need to need to be held by the feminine and they need to be held by their own feminine to say hey it's mm -hmm. okay to cry it's okay to feel these feelings it's okay well i mean i'm not even talking like you have to, to cry i mean just feel what you're going on in your body if you don't cry it's hard for me to cry honestly and it's not because i don't it's not because i don't want to it's i've been going on this journey as much as i as, as much as i can but I, i'm in touch with my feelings um more than ever and, and it's and it's my my business grows the more because everything's on the other side of vulnerability and you'll you can escape that stuff for a while but it's like, that's why people have midlife crises. It's because when you deny how you feel, you're creating an, an, a construct of mind who you think you are, but you're disconnected from reality because reality is in essence is the wisdom of that, your, that of your whole body. The, if if mm -hmm. people, people could understand that our mind is a whole body and we have a relationship with our whole body, that is who we actually are. And it's okay to feel everything. It's neither negative or positive. No emotion is. There's just, if you've got an emotion anchored, then you don't have a choice. You're actually caught in that construct so the relationship with our feelings everything is on the other side of vulnerability it's like the more i speak about my challenges the better my life goes and for so long we we wear these masks and we try to we try to like um we you know we try to live up to how 
we want to be seen by our friends and and then and that gives them permission or they think they have to be a certain way you know and it, and it just creates yeah. a, like a, like a trust just on that just on that while we're on that concept if uh, i'd like to invite you just to to play a bit of a game here and you know is there anything that is really prevalent or you know prominent in your mind or at the forefront of your of your being at the moment that is that you're really kind of fearful or scared or vulnerable to share with you with anyone with your with your friends with the world that you kind of have been stopping yourself from sharing or that you feel a bit like oh what are people going to think of me or what are people going to think that i'm xyz is there anything uh, in you currently that you can share at the moment just to just to you know really you know just just to call it in and snap it in right now as we're talking about it yeah definitely man the biggest fear that i have right now and it's also the biggest excitement that i'm moving into but it is more of a fear is that my highest value is is constant growth and transformation and being true to that and the biggest three triggers that people have zula as you know is money um sexuality and power and if you're on the the spiritual path or the self-development path or the quest for the expression of the totality of of who you actually are, eventually you're going to come up to these points and it's going to be money. It's going to be sexuality or power, power being seen. And, and you look at all the destruction that's created in the world is from money, power and, and the misuse of sexuality or the miss. So it's like there needs to be a, a better, first of all, it's like we want to explore in these areas. So what's happening with me now is there's this path of awakening of, of spirituality and sexuality and, and, and it's like stuff that I thought I would never get into before. And I'm like, whoa, I'm right now, a big part of the mystery school I'm going to is, is a deep journey of integrating sexuality and spirituality um, as a fast radical path of self-awakening. And, and that's one piece of many other things that we're doing. And um, so my fear now is that what happens is when you start talking about triggers that trigger other people because it's in their shadow is the first thing that they do is they shame you. They, they, because it brings up their shame. They're projecting their shame. Anyone who projects something on you is only a projection of them, right? So the first trigger they, they, they throw, they, they shame you. And it's because you're breaking out of the mold. You're breaking out of the tribe. And there's this tribal consciousness of we want to shame you because it's safer to be in the tribe. Don't go out because you'll get eaten by a tiger or something will happen. You know? so, yeah, yeah. And when, you, when we truly get that if we can integrate these dark aspects around money, sexuality, and power, that that is a way that we reconnect to the earth, a lot of the, 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 the shit that's happening on the planet, not only will we love ourselves a lot more deeper and, and live with a higher vibe and a connection to ourselves, the expression of how we, how we deal with money sexuality and power will be a lot more integrated and whole and a lot more fulfilling. There'll be greater ideas and, and more community connection and, and more of a less of a seeking outside of ourselves and a seeking within. So it's less about the outcome and the income of what we, we actually become, the, the true wealth is inside. So my fear currently is I'm moving into this space. And the first thing is, is happening is there's, there's a shaming of others. It's like, what are you doing? And it's, and it's, it's subtle and it's from family and it's from friends and it's from whatever then the next thing that comes after the shame is actually ridicule. And then they, they ridicule and it's like, oh, what are you doing? You're an idiot. And well, if you do that, then don't come back to me. Or I'm going to leave you or I'm not, you know, all this type of, and then if you stay in your power or your truth, people actually start to listen. And mm -hmm. that is the beauty of a master is, is to actually go through those, those, those phases. Um, and I think there's another it's way. That's that's becoming, it's becoming that time, isn't it? It's like, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, so if you, if you stick with that, that's cool, man. So, thanks for sharing that. And yeah, it's powerful stuff. Like, even just talking about it, you find it with stuff and it's moving and it becomes more, I guess, you know, more okay. It's to totally, man. And, um, you know, I believe that, that we have to, we have to, you know, the purpose is not, not to try to be anything, the purpose is to be ourselves, the purpose is how we live our life. and and for me to talk about this stuff and not be able to share what my biggest fear is here wouldn't be me living in line with my own truth. And even if I was still scared of that, it's not about putting a mask on and pushing through that fear. It's understanding, okay, what's true for me and where is my edge and how much can I share here? So when we were talking about the mafia stuff at the beginning, I'm like, whoa, 
I can feel there's some stuff there because I'm like, oh, well, people think that I'm like, you know, like, what will they think about me? You know, so there's still some, honestly, there's still some fears there. So like, I don't, one of the best things that my master told me is there's no top. This is about martial arts. He's like learning. I'm like, and he's like, Ryan, there's no top. And that's, that's a little bit frustrating. At first. What do you mean a top? Because, because the un, undeveloped masculine wants to reach the outcome, wants to reach the, the that's the, one of the qualities that undeveloped. Yeah. yeah. It's like, I just want to get there. And once I have that, everything's going to be fine. He's like, look, there's no top. And I'm like, there's no top. What do you mean? But then actually we can relax into the, the, the moment and, more into the feminine and, and more into the integration of the marriage between two and just enjoy life as, as what it is. And I mean, that's, that's really where the magic is there. We stop seeking anything outside of ourselves and we start to live the life that's true to us. And, and there is no top to this, you know, new, if we're in the game of constant expansion and growth, we're going to, we're going to meet new levels of, mirrors that are going to reflect back to us areas that we don't feel integrated and what i love about this journey zula as we move through the stages of consciousness and we're going up and we're going down and we're going wide and all this what we're awakening is there's different needs on all of the levels and if we can just be true to ourselves our life becomes more integrated across all of these needs and then we start living this fuck yes life it's like this is what i this is what i want and and again until we know that we can't we can't live that and um yeah, we need to be able to first be empowered to say fuck no, because the no is what creates the flow, right? That's what the boundaries of a river is what creates the, is what creates the flow. If there's no boundaries in a river, it's just a swamp. And that most people live in the maybe life. We want people to be living the fuck yes life and being true to their needs. And, and, uh, and, and that's something that like embodying that as well. I love that you're, that you mentioned embodying what it is that we're talking about, because I was just the other day, I think it was yesterday even I was looking at the house at a room and I was like, you know, I'm the kind of person who loves to, you know, I, I have this urge to please, you know what I mean? It's like that people pleasing. It's like, I love to make people feel good and they, they feel good when they're around me. And that's kind of part of my identity in a way. So, you know, the, the house was there. I was like, oh yeah, the house. I wasn't too excited about it. The room was, oh yeah, it was nice. And they're, they're talking to me about it. Uh, so, so you keen, they're super keen about it. Yeah, so if you want to get this place, I think we've got the lease. I'm like, yeah, I was like, oh, you know, I was a bit non-committal, not wanting to go, no, I'm not feeling it. You know, I'm not wanting them to feel bad because of my decision. Um, and then I just sat with it and I was meditating. I was doing some, um, some shanti out on the balcony and it just came to me. I'm like, well, it's not, a f I remember uh, telling myself that if it's not a fuck yes, then it's a, it's a heck no, you know? So, and, and I, I remember that. So as soon as I was like, oh, that's right. I made that decision that if it's not a fuck, yes, there has to be a heck no. If I'm to be really embodying the, my, and staying in my integrity and embodying that principle, then I have to just tell them that. I have to say, hey, to be totally honest with you, it, was, it wasn't a fuck yes for me. So it has to be a heck no. And it's not, no, I did not need, and I went to explain why. And I, I deleted that. I was like, no, I don't need to explain. It's just, that's what it is. And that's it. I'm me being in my integrity. That's it. And then they, they replied going, Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. I love that. I'll probably get the thing anyway, if you want to build something in the future. But so they weren't upset. My fears were unfounded. Um, but they, they were inspired by me staying in my integrity, you know? That's awesome. Zula. Yeah, man. That's it's, it's, uh, I think like, that's one of the, man, like actually I'm just inspired by one of my clients in my, the, spiritual business mastermind they've got like a work like we go in and we transform the culture of their business and stuff like that and um she's actually teaching the kids about boundaries now and uh and it's just phenomenal because like like that's just something that we never we're never taught you know what i mean like we're mm -hmm. never taught to say no and we're never taught to like tune into ourselves and what's important and to be able to express our desires and stuff like that so it's exciting what's what's happening now is this it's like in a way the earth is this where we're descend, descending from the heavens down on earth. You know, there's this calling for let's create heaven on earth. But to do that, it's the, it's the downward journey that's going to create that. And that is through the shadow and that is bringing light and consciousness down into, to really connecting down. And I think, oh, man, I just think that's, um, I just think that's an, well, it causes, it causes all you know, the, the underdeveloped, I guess like the, it's the solar plexus, really that power, you know, you're talking about power, sexuality, all the, you know, the sacred, the solar plexus kind of, <clears throat> um, even the worth, you know, if you, the first three chakras are on here, which is like the physical, the wealth, the worth, all this stuff, underdeveloped money, um, money, power, sexuality, <clears throat> the, 
you know, how much fucked up shit that causes in terms of like, you look at hashtag me too movement, you look at all just like this slavery and basic things like this, or you know, women's rights, all, the, all of these stuff that is kind of messed up. It's really good that people are, I think it's, it's promising that people are looking at these things now, you know, like, okay, I'm feeling that, that uh, ascending kind of consciousness that's like, oh, the awareness is coming up, the equality, the environment, things like this. So we're like, hang on a sec, this isn't right. There's something wrong with this, you know, and, and I love that people are out there talking about it, being vulnerable, being okay with talking about these things that are, you know, that we don't talk about, we're not supposed to talk about. Yeah, that, that's right. It's definitely, it's a beautiful change. And I think like, like on that too, I think it's, um, it's important to have those conversations. And I think what's important is that um, also we just don't shame the shame, you know, like, like it's, <laughs> it's like share it, raise it. And it's, you know, let, let everything sort of unfold the way it needs to. And I think those conversations are, are good, but um, yeah, I think like, you know, just victim consciousness is a, is a, you know, when we blame another person, all we do is give our power out. There's no self-responsibility there. You know, it's like, Oh, it's the government's fault. Oh, it's my girlfriend's fault. My boyfriend's fault. Or it's this situation's fault. Or if it didn't happen like that, like we just put it out of ourselves and we can't blame and take self-responsibility at the same time. So, you know, I just, yeah, I just think I, I I'm all for those things, but I'm, but I'm, you know, my thing is like, wow. We, and it's, it's beautiful. Every time we take that self-responsibility, our life changes, you know? Um, uh, about it. Yeah. Well, that's the thing for me as well. I'm, I'm a big, I guess it, people are like, oh, I'm a control freak. You know, people talk about, oh, I'm such a control freak. I'm like saying that you're a control freak is almost putting the control on that side of yourself in a way, in a yeah. weird way. It's like you're blaming this thing of I am this. Like, no, you'll just have whoever you want to be, however you want to be in any yeah. given moment. So what do you want to be? Oh, what do, what do I want? Is, is Was that a question for me or is that? It's in general. It's like, what do you, yeah. what do we want to be in any given moment? You know? So I, I'm a big believer that the questions we ask empower us. And that's, I love that, you know, like you have those principles, you have the 13 principles, you have the, these, uh, the 10 daily habits. These are all questions that you're asking yourself, you know, and you're mm -hmm. thinking about. So, you know, I believe, are there some questions or, yeah, are there questions that, uh, that you remember either masters t telling you or just ones that stand out in your mind? I know you've spoken to and worked with some pretty high level people. Like, I don't know, you did talk to about working with brands and teaching Qigong and stuff. Are there, are, are there questions you asked these people or are there questions that they asked you that have, that have stuck with you and you really remember? <sighs> Meeting meeting Richard Branson was cool because that that guy is, <laughs> he's incredible, very spiritual dude, like naturally. But you know, like he was hanging around with Dalai Lama or Nelson Mandela, and you know, he had the, he had the group, the elders group that was you know I actually done an interview on yeah on Necker Island. Um, anyway, I think like one of the questions that we asked him was um, um, there's so many ways I could answer this question, but one of the questions that that we asked him was what's your best tip in business? And, and he was like, get out of business. And we're like, what? Like, what's the best tip? Like, get out of business. I was like, get out of business. Yeah. And like, literally it's like step out and get the best people in. And you know, so the, the fastest thing you can do is actually get out. And it's that principle, like eat, eat people, like, you know, as well, Zulu. Um, it's just like, and this is why business is like the ultimate spiritual journey because it's like we have to die to the, our old self constantly and rise to the next level. We have to let go. And, um, and I think the encouragement for me is like for all the spiritual people out there listening who are interested in business is to get in there and the reframe is that business is the most ultimate spiritual journey. Because here's something that I learned from a, uh, there's some cool things I learned from some monks. There's one monk that I met and he's like, Ryan, um, do you know where the, the, he's ahead of this temple. He's like, Ryan, do you know where the darkest place is? on the planet and i was like darkest place on the planet I'm like i don't know he's like it's inside the temple inside the temple i'm like, gonna be sitting there meditating with you guys you guys are like vibrant bright super peaceful and you know all that type of stuff i was like what do you mean he's like well no they're not facing the world they're so they're not going out and facing the world I was like, whoa and um i don't know whether it was just a transmission for me or that was something like that you know that was coming through but it was like when we actually have a business we have to face the world and we have to face 
failing and 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 the, you know the fear of abandonment or, or 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 betrayal or what will people think of us or and and you know all of these things come up in business and that's why I feel that's why I awoken to like, wow, business is the ultimate spiritual journey because you've got to be out there showing up and you've got to have it all on display and you've, you're going to be, and you know what, doesn't matter how good you do, you're going to get ridiculed. There's always going to be the, the there's always going to be the negativity there. There's always going to be the people that don't like it. Quite often they're just projecting their own wounds because they're not living their life to their path, which is a, which is a gift for them. It triggers something in them, and and often the amount of people that I've triggered in my path that end up going off and doing great things is kind of, it's kind of it's kind of cool, you know. So yeah, I think spiritual is the, the the yeah business is the ultimate spiritual journey as long as we can integrate it through the other levels of consciousness too. So it's done in a more integral way. So. Well, that was a cool question they asked you. Do you know where the, the darkest place on earth is? That's, uh, that's the one that is memorable there. Uh, are there some that have stumped you? Are there some questions that people have asked you and you're still scratching your head trying to come up with an answer? Or? Oh, um, nothing that recalls, but I, but you know, I'm constantly in the question. So I feel like I'm, I'm uh, always like, you know, like, oh, what is the, it's that if we're tuned into the now, I, I, and, and we're honestly on this this path of of um, um the question from Bruce Lee like it's very difficult to honestly express ourselves and I used to think oh, it's not that hard you know you just but the more you get connected into your actual understanding the actualization of self and the understanding of self and our feelings and our emotions and you know it's it, it's true it, it it is difficult to honestly. Ex, ex, express who we are because to do that we have to know our soul values or our soul calling and and we have to align to that and we have to create a life around that and we have to there's got to be an environment that can come out through that and 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 also we can actually honestly express ourselves as well it's a bit of a paradox in itself but the, but the more you deeply think about that it can for me it can be like oh am i actually because the deeper you go into that question there's levels of layers or dimensions yeah and it's just like wow because you know as a creator my i'm naturally good at visioning things so it's like my questions will go in me and my brain is wired to think of the future in, in many ways so it's kind of like i'll go into the, you know that's why spiritual practice is good because you can drop into the nowness and then use that to to elevate um vision so speaking on the, on the future i know you mentioned a bit about the future and you know, living from that space where the the memory isn't as, as powerful and prominent as the, the future is. Can you paint us a little bit? Because you did mention about you know, the kids in the school, the, the Qigong being in the in the daycare centers. Just paint, paint us a little bit about a future that you'd like to see, like in, in the world, because this is something that inspires me as people's vision and, you know, yeah. a bit of, uh, going forward into the, the world we're trying to create. Um or the world we are creating by thinking into existence. So yeah, I'd love to hear what, what you're painting in your, in your uh, mental kind of uh, landscape, you know? Yeah. I'll, I'll, if you don't mind, I'll share my calling and what I'm, what I'm, what I'm doing in, in my soul journey and my business journey, because they're very integrated, if that's okay. Perfect. Cool. So I'm focused on high performing entrepreneurs um, because they make the greatest impact. So like I like you, after a while we have to delegate our time to some type of niche. Doesn't mean that that has to be the be all or end all, but but so high performing entrepreneurs is where is one of the areas that I'm focused on because they have a big uh, audience. So if I can impact them, get them landed in their soul, connected to their body, the earth, etc., and the heavens as well, then everything they create and everyone they inspire is from that essence, that core unique frequency that's connected to earth and heaven. So that is like leverage it's an intelligent way of, of where i dedicate my spiritual energy or my calling or the gifts that i've you know inherited from lots of the different teachers um so that's one piece because entrepreneurs go out and lead that change and if they're more connected to heaven and earth they'll do it in a more harmonious way and it's beautiful so they will go out and disrupt markets and create things that are that are good for the planet um then the next next thing is is uh well this is the middle piece but the beginning piece is um, it's children and being able to have early education centers. Like one of my clients um, has a beautiful um, daycare center and it's influencing uh, early education 
you know, it's like when it's like, okay, younger ages, okay, grade one. Okay. It's like, it's like the more higher you get up, the more important it is. But as we know from doing the deep psycho emotional work, zero to seven is where you anchor all your shit. And, and that's, and it's all you're developing your adult consciousness. So whatever's being emotionally anchored in is a big part of who you become and, and they're the struggles and, the, and everything else like that. So it's like early education needs to be really looked at and and they need to be paid better they need and they need it that's where it begins so for me it's like if because it's like you're gonna it's like the stronger the foundation the better the success is you know why would we want to treat our kids like a uh, house of cards and not even worry about the first part and then okay you're getting into high school now let's take it seriously it's like what take it like where's your so for me i'm really uh, it just stirs me up but it's like being able to have um you know early age education they're being better cared for and more consciousness around the development of, of kids at that younger age is super important. And I'm working with a client at the moment and, we're, and she's bringing that through and I'm just, in, and I'm just working with it, elevate that. And that, that is an important part because the kids are the leaders of tomorrow. Cause literally if we all got together as a collective now and just decided, let's bring in early education, let's get an integral model and let's make it work. And if we all decided that as a collective, then literally all the generational problems would, would end because we're starting at the beginning point. The kids are the, uh, uh, the leaders of tomorrow. So that is a really important part of my, on my soul. The, the middle piece is the consumer market because the consumer is actually what demands the market. So like, even though the entrepreneurs can lead and fail and disrupt markets and, and push and, and do all that type of stuff to create change, at the end of the day, it's the, it's the collective consciousness of the greater mass, the consumers that actually dictate the way that markets go. So if all of a sudden everyone decided that, hey, we want, we want organic food, the food that our grandparents were eating, you know, and a lot of people forget that that was the, that will eat, you know, and it's just like, you know, my, 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 my granddad, it was only when he was 86 had his first tooth problem. You know what I mean? Not me, because I, I was drinking Coca Cola and Mars bars and everything when I was younger. Think it, I, and then when I read my first health book, I'm like, why would you even put this shit on the shelf if you know, I'll just eat, you know, consume it? I was like, what the hell? So, you know, they didn't have that sort of problem back then. They were eating out of the garden, and you know, he's, he was from Lebanon, so they had all these beautiful fruits and herbs and olive oils and, and you know, hummus and dips and stuff like that. And um, so there's like a healthier, healthier lifestyle. And um, and so it's the consumer. So if we can consciously impact the consumer to make uh, to make a demand on the market to make more aligned choices, the, the business people will always will respond to the consumer market. Because if all of a sudden every person turned around and said, Hey, we want organic food to all the supermarket, to everything, all of a sudden they would, they would hustle and they would make it work. And then all of a sudden we're so creative as humans, you know, we just need to be asking a better question and we need to be more connected to not our own self self management first then to others and then the collective. And once we're connected to those three things, if they were taught in early education, hey, what are your personal needs? Because if you can look after yourself, Confucius saying, I know this has been a bit of a Confucius chat, but it's like, <laughs> if you can manage yourself, you can manage your home. If you can manage your home, you can manage a city. If you can manage a city, you can manage a state. If you manage a state, you can manage your country. I think I added an extra one in there, but the whole essence is if you can manage yourself, then you can manage the greater. And if we're projecting out on other people, it's your fault. In we're projecting our self-responsibility out. We don't take self-responsibility, so we're not even clear on what we want. So then we create a world that's disconnected from our needs, which is disconnected from the earth, etc. So it's really about coming within. So they're the three areas that I'm sort of focused on. That's my calling. Um, so like, and that's my quest at the moment is to build, is to is to build out services in each of those areas. So beautiful. And just on that. It's a, is there anybody, any key people of influence, any kind of people that you're looking for to connect with? Because obviously you've got the bit of a platform here, like people will be watching this and listening to this and, I, and me being the connector I am, you know, I'm always trying to connect people and go, oh, that's an amazing vision. I know someone who would, who would be perfect for their education or, oh, this person's really great for the consumer. Is there anybody that you want to just put a call out for that would be really key piece in helping that come to, come to life? Oh, you know, all I could say is if you're listening to this and you want to be a part of the vision and you have some value or something you can bring, please reach out. Because one of my, one of my, even though it, it, it looks like I have an, an amazing network and I do like, but it's like, I'm actually kind of recluse. And I think it's a lot of my training from living on the mountains. I sort of keep to my own path. Like even in the Qigong movement, like I've had these incredible masters, at least five really masters that I've got 
good transmission and lineage from. But as you know, Zul, I sort of keep to my own thing. So one of my one of my things I need to work on for myself is actually to get outside of that comfort zone and connect with people that can help stuff happen. So what I would say is if you if you're listening to this and you feel called or inspired or you are a high performing entrepreneur and you like to, to reach out for something or you are the general collective and you like to go through some training or you feel or you are in the kids thing or anything like that if you feel like you can support that like please reach out to me because like um that's one of the things that i need to work on and get better on myself and i wouldn't really even know but if there's any investors that would like to invest and um help speed up this evolution um or any anyone from the business realm or any investors that would like to do this because for me i don't believe in the pyramid way of me being on the top. I know it's a good model. I believe in a model that goes like this, it goes out, you know? And for me, it's just like, I want to bring it through and, and allow that model to go out. So it's like everyone, ben, like transpersonal growth and is, um, is really what I'm looking for. So if anyone's like, right, I want to back this and let's get this happening faster and sooner, then yeah, I'm all down for people reaching out. That's um, uh, anyone who feels aligned to it, really. If their soul calling mm -hmm. is that, then please reach out. 100%. And there's, there's that definite, something that I can attest to is the, is the direct transmission, you know, that we were talking about having that direct, being in someone's presence, that one-to-one. -one. I know you've, you've more now one for many in working with groups of people and being more online and things like this. Uh, I, I personally can attest to the, having that one-on-one -on -one transmission, you know, meeting you and I getting together and just having that first Okay, cool. That re reconnection with the gong, reconnection with the nagong is like these new learnings and just having that direct. Uh, and that's something that's super powerful. That's why I love, like, I have my Sunday sessions where I get to work with people. And now I'm doing more qigong classes in one on one or one to group where I actually get to touch people and physically move them and, and have that direct, uh, you know, being in person. We can still get it through video and whatnot, but just having someone in your life who is there, this is something that is a, is a big feedback I get from a lot of people. They're like, I don't know what it is about you, Zulu, but just being around you and my life is improving, you know, and it's that, it's that Wu Wei kind of idea of like, okay, you're being, it's like a lot of the concepts you were talking about with the Zen Archer, I'm like, oh, the stuff you're talking about is stuff that I'm being and people are getting, it's similar stuff we're talking about, but it's, it's so true. If you can get around someone who is, who is vibrating in an energy or, you know, at a frequency that is like, like, what you're after or it's just for me it's all, it's exactly that it's being really calm and relaxed but getting heaps of shit done <laughs> you know it's like totally. I, I, I want to get heaps of shit done i want to be productive but i don't want to have to be too much exerting energy like that's not my style you know me i'm a, i'm, I'm yeah. flawed you know i'm like, I'm like that guy who's just oh, yeah, yeah. Moving, but all these how the hell does he get all these things and he doesn't look like he moves a muscle you know and having that effect on people I feel is something that can be cultivated. So it's like either be that yourself or get around people who positively influence you and, and look at your own circle of influence and how you can actually be a positive or a beneficial impact in their lives as well. And that's just to bring it back. I'm like anyone who does any investor, anyone who does want to get together with you, I can, I can attest to the direct transmission being powerful, being beneficial as well. Oh, thanks, Zulu. I really appreciate that. And I, I very, very much so, man. And um, I felt your chi too coming onto this call. I was like, wow, okay, cool. This is really, really great. So um, it's beautiful, you know, like it, it, I think one of the best gifts that you can transmit to some people is just the activation of their chi, you know? So like, it's a really mm -hmm. nice feeling and um, you got Jing Chi Shen. So it's like the more that, that the chi is activated, it's like the more that your consciousness naturally follows. So, uh, I think it's a beautiful, beautiful gift. And uh, I could come in on this call. I was like, wow, I could feel, I could feel your chi. And it was like, it was really, really cool, man. So, and yeah, you know, just Zula, I know you're, you're super dedicated, super focused. And, um, you know, you're one of the rare handful of people when I met that was able to transmit that stuff pretty much directly from the mountains. when I came back that, that the Nagong that we did and uh, yeah, yeah, you just took to it like a duck in the water and, and uh, you just went on and, and it was great, man. So um, yeah, and it's, it's, it's beautiful what you're doing because 
you're literally impacting the world with mindfulness and consciousness and and it's uh, it takes more than one person that the whole idea of someone being at the very top is is just too slow and it needs to spread out you know what i mean and um yeah so it's really exciting what we're seeing in the, in, in the world now with um you know even though we can talk a lot about the problems and the shadowy stuff there's there's it's important just to you know the paradox it's important to focus on the vision and, and the outcomes and the beauty of what's taking place and and allow our because our, consciousness is a subtle form of matter so whatever we're focusing on we're actually influencing um and and basically you know it's, it's good to have the, that positive frame that positive focus and and that 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 light and to be spreading something um yeah which is which is which is important I'm pumped for you to, to do this uh, temple training and see you, you come out with some more mathematician wizard powers. It's going to be exciting <laughs> in 10 days. Are you, is, is Japan still happening this year or is that being pushed back on? Yeah, there was a book being written this year and then there was also the Japan piece. But look, the soul just called so deeply for the mystery school tr training. So, um, so deeply, like when I very first went to, to China and... Um, so it was for me, it was like, okay, this just has to be done. And um, this is what, what I'm doing. So I feel like I just had that soul calling. And when that soul calls, I feel like you've got to, you've got to answer to it. It's um, it just, everything seems to self organize around that so much more smoothly when we honor that soul calling. And uh, it doesn't mean it won't be challenging. It just means I just feel like it's greater and more benefit. It is more greater and beneficial for us when we follow that with that, that essence. And um what, 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 have, what have been some of the, the biggest challenges that you've faced and, and overcome so far just in your journey, whether life, whether health, whether wealth, whether family, whether business? Uh, cool. Very cool. Here, talk about vulnerable, talking about sharing all the things in this, this podcast. Wow. Um, I, actually, I actually had a skin cancer and not many people know, uh, know that and actually because all of the Qigong and all the training basically kept me alive. I had a, a, a level four melanoma, which is a, the, the worst level you could get. It was on the middle of my back and I was going to the doctors. I went to the doctor three or four times, a skin specialist, not just a doctor, a skin specialist. And they would look at it and they're like, no, it was totally fine. And uh, because they would, you know, they'd ask me the question, how are you going? Yeah, great. What do you, what's your life like? I'm like, yeah, cool, doing this, doing this. And I'm like, oh, this, this guy, you know. And so I guess they just like bypassed it. And then I got back from Necker Island and uh, my friend has beard season. It's, I invited him to Necker Island to come um, meet Richard Branson. And he's, he's um, uh, got a movement of 80,000 people. And, and, and in winter, they encourage you to grow a beard. So, you know, shout out to, um, to Scott, um, you know, check out beard season. And he and he's like this genuine dude who's just doing it for love of the project because his best friend died of a melanoma, and so he uh, he encouraged you in winter to grow a beard and use it as a conversation starter to encourage people to get a skin check. So check out Beard Season. Uh, anyone on on this call, go and get a go and get a skin check because literally it could save your life. And um, yeah, I just went in when I got back from Necker Island. How, how does someone go about that? If they go to beardseason.com, they'll be able to find out how to do all of that. Yeah, just just type in um, uh, beard season, and you'll see Scott with a big beard. And I, look, to be honest, I don't. He's he's got a group and follow him. He, he's a real genuine dude. He's doing it for the cause, and and you know he helped he helped me out a lot because it was like, man, I was like, wow, okay, because I went in there, and I just said to them, look, for me to get my body cut, or I don't think I had any. Um, natural i didn't have any medicine for probably like 10 years or something like that you know very pure to the path i was also not eating meat for a couple of years when this took place so i have di you know i have different views about i'm not I'm, I'm not convinced on on anyone should be in a box where yeah. you know it's like honor your own self is the best medicine that you can really do um and putting a label in a box on yourself is is, is where you will get sick i feel because if you're so caught up on the judgment of oh am i being a vegan or not being a vegan dude that stuff is also hurting me you know and uh it's like you need just to be true to your desires and if you need if you feel compelled to if you feel not compelled if you feel like meat is a medicine and have some medicine i'm more about the over consuming is the main problem on the planet you know that's that's the main thing i i don't i don't um you know and yeah so i don't want to put myself in any sort of boxes i'd rather live true to myself and live in harmony with the planet um this is also some there's also some good evidence that that pure veganism is also not great 
for, for the planet as well. And anyway, uh, that's a whole other conversation. But just yeah, to I don't want to open up a can of worms here. And, uh, big love to veganism. And I'll probably end up being a, a vegan later on. Who knows? But it's it's um, this whole thing put me on a, on, a, on, a, on a deeper quest. And so I just went in there and I said, I need you to cut. This. I'm just hearing a bunch of vegans going, if you were vegan, this would never have happened. <laughs> well, I was, I was eating no meat. So this is the whole thing, you know, like the, the whole thing is like, like I, I wasn't eating any meat, you know? So it's like, and so it's just, a, it's just an interesting thing. But, but also Zulu, one of the reasons why I like to feel my emotions more is I feel when I look at the spiritual causes for, for a melanoma and it's, I wish I could reference the book and please hit me up if you want the book. Cause I think it's great. I'll, I'll ask my friend and, and um, some of the spiritual causes was because I, the emotional causes that they don't speak about was actually the, some of the causes. So that's why it's important to feel your emotions. Otherwise you're suppressing stuff and that's, an important piece. So it's an integral model. I don't feel like diet is the be all end all, you know, it's a, it's an integral model, spiritual, emotional, mental, physical, and energetic. These aspects need to be. So, and so you went, so you went like the fifth time. So you went the fifth time to the, to the same skin specialist or. Yeah. On the fifth time I went in and I said, right. Um, to, to, to a different what, person. Cause I got, what kept you going back because was it like, Oh, there's obviously something or like, what was, what, why were you there for the fifth time? If you, yeah, if I, was, you know, I was going, I was going, going back to get them to look at the exact same spot. So it wasn't like a general check. I was like, you know, and then on the fifth time I was like, my intuition was, was, was coming hard. It was like, right. Because I was like, Oh, anyway. So I went in and I said, look, I need you to just take this out. The first thing I said, look, I've been to four different people. They said, it's not a problem. I don't feel good about it. I, I just want, I needed to give them the certainty to take this thing out, you know? And then he looked at it and he goes, yeah, I, I think it's a good idea. Took it out four days later. I got a call. Your whole life changes when you get that call. And, um, and it was like, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, it was like, look, it's a, it's a level four. And um, uh, like, yeah. Anyway. So, so basically then this question of like, crap, like you've got two weeks to make a decision. You've got to go down the, the, the Western medical path, or you can look at a natural path. It was hard to find a lot of good stuff around the natural path. Uh, and every situation is, this is why I'm like, there needs to be an integral perspective around both. So I went integral. So I went deep into Taoist internal alchemy. I went deep into herbs um, and I went deep into juicing. And then also when you see the doctors, because there's not enough study around what the herbs do, they suggest you not to take any herbs because it can interfere with some of the, you know, stuff like that. So this is the thing. But there needs to be more of a, needs to be testing and it needs to be a conversation of an integral piece because there's good evidence for, for both. And, and so I went deep into that and I had two weeks until I had to get a, what's called a sentinel biopsy um, procedure. Um, I had to, so one, once it's, if it's a level four, you have to take two and a half centimeters around the mark. So literally I've got a scar on my back. That's like this big on the left of my spine. So it's about, it's about, you know, uh, I don't know, like a hand width or whatever it is. It's a big scar because the mark was like that and they have to take a two and a half centimeter radius and then they have to draw the skin in to just, you know, to just in, ensure that it's not going to spread. And I thought, okay, cool. That's fine. Um, and, and then look, it's a, it was a hard decision to, to make and, I ended up having to do sentinel biopsy, which is like they took, there's about 20 or 30 nodes in each arm pit. So they took two nodes from here, one nodes from here. It was, it was sort of sad in a way. And I learned lots of lessons through this um, because your, all of the Qigong and all of the practices. So what was the process? So you had to go through, you had to actually go into like a general anesthetic and all this kind of stuff. And you had to decide, you had to yeah. say this, I want this out, this out, this out. Well, well, <sighs> It's, I think it's called a sentinel biopsy uh, procedure and um, <laughs> you get your degree in this in about two weeks. And then uh, a lot of this, I can't quite remember, but a shout out to the, um, uh, the melanoma center in, in Sydney. Um, they're like, like literally the, the leaders in the, in, 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 in the world around this. And I had um, a professor who's written so many states, case studies on this. He done the, and he done a beautiful job um, on this as well. And, I had two weeks to try to make sure that this did not sp spread into the lymphatic system, um, which would knock it up a, a case in, in severity. Um, so I went deep into Qigong, uh, Nagong, herbs, juicing, fasting, 
sleeping like a boss, like your life depended on. So I'm grateful for all my past training because I was able to like discipline myself to drop in and made sure that my environment was taken care of and, and that because I'm like, cool. The only absolute certain way that you could know that it hasn't passed from a medical perspective, that it hasn't passed, and so you know for sure that it hasn't passed in the lymphatic system, was I would never get chemo and stuff like that. And I, I never want to say never, but I, I, I wouldn't. Um, and But the only certain way was to get this test. So it's this thing of like, shit, do you, you know? And it, and it was hard. I was sort of on the fence, and I didn't really want to do it. But I believe in integral. This, this test was a this test was a was a, a radioactive test, was it? No. What they are, I guess, in some ways, the you know, I want to be mindful that I'm that I'm that that I was more aware of the choices I was making throughout this journey, and you know, I mightn't be quoting all of the right things. But what they do is they inject a dye into your back because you remember I didn't have any, I didn't take, I didn't even take it. Panadol, you know me, Panadol, anything. I, I was, I, there was no need for me to do that. And, and in this process of natural mm. living, but I think it was the denial of my spiritual and emotional, particularly my emotional body that I think caused a lot of this. And look, if I knew about it earlier, I would have been able to treat it in probably more of a natural setting. And look, everything is perfect as it is. You know, you get a lot of lessons from it. The universe has equal support. And so what they had to do is inject the dye into the back. Uh, and then they put you in this machine where they it spins you around and they track where the dye goes into the lymphatic system and it showed up in two nodes here, a secondary node above here and one here. So because it was in the middle of the back, unfortunately, it's going to spread to both sides of the lymph, maybe, and which it did, which means they'd have to cut here, cut here, take the node, test it, test the node to see, to see if anything showed up in it. And, um, and basically it came back hundred percent clean and you know, I had two weeks to get to that, to that level and make sure that it was that, that, you know, so I literally went pure and clean. And uh, cause what I was noticing Zulu was not so much a, uh, I was still performing high, but it just felt like all of these empowering practice. Like I've got masters that are like 118 and different crazy ages that are in flow doing all these beautiful things. And I'm like, why am I at this age? And I'm feeling tired and not sleeping as deep. And because I broke up with my girlfriend three years ago, I thought it was heartbreak and then I thought it was the entrepreneurial journey and then I thought it was coming back from the mountains living a pure life and living back in modern society and trying to run a business and going through the heartbreak and that so I thought a lot of it was to do with that and I was like yeah man this is and to be fair a lot of it was to, to some of that was was true um but uh yeah so basically yeah. So anyway, I had two weeks. I went deep into it, and then I really looked after myself after the after the procedure. And you know, I, I and would I recommend someone get that procedure done? Probably. You need to. You just need to really tune into yourself because there are some things now that I have to look after. I feel like I have to look after myself a, a little bit better. Well, actually, after that happens, you're like, no, you look after yourself better. You know what I mean? Like, um, you want to <laughs> take care of yourself. You got no I, choice. Yeah, yeah, and it's kind of there's a, there's a blessing in that, and uh, so yeah, I'm not sure what the original question was of 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 how this. Well, it was it was how specifically you overcame how specifically you overcame what challenges what what challenge like what for you during that process what were the biggest kind of you were what did you have to think about were you thinking about like shit I'm gonna have to write a rule were you thinking about shit do it do I want what, am I, like, you, what kind of questions were you asking yourself? What was the conversation inside you? Uh, and then coming out of it, like, what are your, what's the mindset now or the mind frame now? Are you more dedicated to living, your, you know, your, like being on your path? Are you more, you know, like, yeah. how have you changed things or if, if at all? Yeah. So the Zen Archer program is how I change things because I realized, um, and one of the philosophies, one of the 10 things is a zero stress policy. And one thing that I realized in that experience is most of the stress that we experience is imaginary or just not even real. So like one of the policies is zero stress, no stress whatsoever. So I don't I, like, don't get me wrong. Stress is a beautiful thing that, that it can be healthy for you as well. Um, but most of the stress that people experience. You stress, you stress and distress. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like a balance point, but, but it's like, but um, most of the, yeah, like it, it's just an illusion, most of the stress. Of it. And I've got a beautiful video when I was tap right into this inside the Zen Archer program that, that I really dropped the transmission of that. But like now the one thing that I do is I don't, I don't hustle or I don't, I don't, you know what I mean? I live completely more deeply in alignment as a result of that. Um, and 
yeah, so what I got out of it is I, as I re- literally reevaluated my whole life, what's going on from spiritual, mental, physical, emotion, this, this shouldn't have happened with the life I was living, what's going on, it, it, it gave me a deeper appreciation for my emotional body and the emotions that I was suppressing at a deeper level. Um, and, you know, and like, I think that, uh, yeah, also diet and, you know, many things, because even from a Dallas perspective, there's some Dallas that don't eat any meat, but there's also some Dallas that, that, that believe that, and even the Dallas that don't eat meat view meat as a form of medicine for bones and, and, um, and tendons and, and, uh, or, or just different parts of the body. So that, that was, uh, now there's just no labels with Ryan Nasser. It's more about who I am and honoring who I am throughout it and not getting caught up in a box, a box of you're this or you're that, or you're, you're, you know what I mean? Or, or you're whatever, even the millionaire monk brand is probably going to dissolve because that was about mindfulness and my, like being a spiritual entrepreneur in essence. That's what it was about because I've, there's about uh, five people that have helped um, go from almost zero in some cases. Yes. To creating multi-million dollar lifestyles where their life is aligned with their values and they're, they're giving back to harmony and they're living a beautiful, giving back to humanity, I mean, in a harmonious way. Um, and they're tapped into their spiritual path. And then I live with these monks as well. So, and then I was training entrepreneurs. And so like, and I'd had these multiple seven figure businesses that I ran um, for other people that, and that I scaled. So the whole millionaire monk brand came, but now it's like, okay, monk and millionaire doesn't integrate the, the, the tantric or, sexual path either so that label is is crumbling so it's like there's a danger and it's like and what the ego does is it tries to find a better box for us to be in and after a while it's just fuck the boxes you just just live true to yourself and are you in alignment with your own values and your own agreement and and if you're getting ridiculed or getting whatever or, or you're doing something positive and people are throwing up challenges just check in and go am i living true to my values and that's one of the things that where that I'm inspired to help people with is just that because then the real question comes of what life do you want? How do you want to serve? How do you want to impact? Because you don't have to be a millionaire or a billionaire, or maybe you do want to be, but it's like, can you, can you live your life true to your values and create, create an environment where you're okay with money, you're okay with power, you're okay with sexuality, you're okay. With, I mean, they're just the main triggers. You don't have to go fully, fully deep into those areas either, but, but it's just like, awaken the sense of what your needs are across all levels of consciousness and be okay to change and transform as your identity shifts mm-hmm. because identities come and go and but your soul will always be true to you and it'll always be there underneath the surface and i feel that that's what tapping in each day <clears throat> even just dropping in whether it's a, a daily practice whether, you know whether it's a gong whether it's a yoga whether it's a taking a breath whether it's looking at the birds whether, whatever it is just to take a moment to be and to, to not do anything, I feel that's one of the most powerful practices, just coming back to yourself, coming back to that soul, coming back. And that actually is food. For me, that's food. That's like, yeah, we feed, we eat breakfast, we eat lunch, we eat dinner, whatever. We, we read books, we learn stuff, we do courses, we do programs, we do workshops, we watch stuff on documentary, whatever it is to learn. We have conversations, we interact. That's mental food. Uh, but a lot of people aren't having that soul food, you know, that stillness that just filling up and filling up on the nature so that for me that's my biggest you know like i even in the everything i kind of all my questions i'm kind of biased in the way that i will question people because i'm like if it's supporting that confirmation bias for me like if that's something for me then that's the message i i, I want to be spreading so i love that you're out there doing it working with the kids you know having this uh, future vision what that involves people actually taking up um, practices which will give them that food because then we're going to have a, a soul nourished mm, mm. population you know and that for me i feel is going to be a it's going to be a fun time it's going to be a better time for for my children their children so on and so forth yeah so good so good we are we are responsible for the generations to come you know and what we what 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 seeds we sow in water now will will, will be the prosperity that they get to evolve from you know so it's important that we create new ways of, of a new threshold of consciousness new ways of being and it's just how we show up and um that's why doing the work that we that we live for zulu is important because that's where true transformation takes place and i've got a really cool challenge for everyone who's listening to that just came through it's like get clear on what's important for you like the, the the juicy words like soul or mindfulness or oneness or or um uh 
you know, soul values or what, whatever it is and get really clear on what you're really juiced up about or, or the life that you want to create and literally start having conversations and asking questions in your Facebook because like the crazy thing about Facebook is whatever word you tap in, it starts to, those algorithms start feeding that back to you. Right. So, so, and this is how the universe works anyway. It's almost like they've just got an algorithm of how our consciousness works. They just plugged into that in, in, in some way. So, so start in, you start um, having these conversations and literally you, the world, even on social media will start reflecting that back to you and advertisements and everything, which put you on path. And then um, much sooner, but it also enables you to be empowered to, to, to have the life that you want reflecting back to you. And, um, mm. and, and just know that on the other side of your vulnerability or your triggers is, 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 the, is the goal that you've been looking for. And, and once the ego dies, you know, this beauty arises in rebirth, which is, which is you get to plan out. Anytime, anytime anyone says ego dies, I just immediately, my mind goes DMT. <laughs> Straight away, <laughs> <laughs> straight away, is like that. Just try it, or, or just smoke some DMT, or just have a like a heroic <laughs> dose of mushrooms. <laughs> yeah, the first time I had, uh, uh, it's, yeah, DMT was with you. Remember in Byron Bay, we just yeah, filmed, was. Um, spiral prat training, and I was teaching the Qigong down there, and then somehow we magically ended up at the same place. And James Gelkos came out, the shaman that he is and who goes out into the bush and grabs the black wattle and goes through that full deep process just to be able to bring it into that substance and that natural way. And then he did the do and everything. And I just remember laughing so hard when I took mine and you guys coming out and you guys were just like full soul brothers holding space. And, and um, the integration that took place, I remember seeing all of these, these like white light little men, like thousands of them in my consciousness and they all represented um, my problems, but, but, it was like, it was like the, the, the consciousness space that I tapped into, it was so far beyond that. It, it, the problems, they were just laughing at me. Like they, and they just all dissolved. Like, it, it's like once you elevate yourself, it's like, ah, oh, don't even worry about all those. So it's like, I think, I think a lot of people out there, if they're working so hard, stop and look at what you can do to integrate. I'm not saying you have to smoke DMT. And, I, and look, I wouldn't do it in an irresponsible way. Like I was with a, shaman with a supportive group the, the love was there the, the the whole process was there all of it from the guy who goes out and spends two or three months in the bushes to you know to, and actually goes through this process so but even qigong is a, is a way of integrating because you're opening up your consciousness to heaven and earth and you know the body opens up like we said at the beginning look for ways to integrate for me it's about taking this ascended wisdom and bringing it down into reality i want to feel it as actual results and i want to feel it as this is my life Speaking the same language. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. 100%. We could talk forever, man, but it's been nice. This is a nice little intro. I'm sure we'll do it again sometime, but uh, we got to wrap up. It's almost two o'clock. So, it's been a pleasure. If there's any, if there's any last little thoughts you'd like to leave us with, or just, yeah, any, anything you'd like to share now would be the time. Cool. Um, harmony within is harmony on the planet. And, uh, you know, just, just keep, stand for your truth and be authentic to yourself and and just know that if you're living in alignment with your agreements and you're in harmony with heaven and earth then you know you're going to be looked after and it's all going to be good and you'll find your tribe and you'll find your crew and yeah and big love to anyone who's on that path so um thank you so much zulu for you know just uh you know this this is literally aligned through the essence of Wu Wei, as we know how this call came about so um it's great to reconnect dude and i'm looking forward to uh speaking to you in the future man and thank you very much again Yes, indeed. My absolute pleasure. And yeah, keep, keep up the good work, man. You're out there doing good things in the world and being, being the change that you're wishing to see because that's what we love to see. So look forward again to working with you and, and to next time, man. So until next time, guys, appreciate you tuning in. And uh, yeah, until then, keep the flow growing and the growth flowing. Oh, yeah. <laughs>